Okay, let's listen to my favorite liberals that have like some minor aesthetic differences, but not even all that much talk about the comings and goings of Russia and Ukraine. Pretty obvious. There are no good options. When deterrence fails, there are no good options anymore. And, and the right. grave failure of the West was that we spent 30 years basically thinking that bad people are not bad people if we talk to them strong enough and if we... And if we negotiate with them or if we ignore... Like, what's your what's your suggestion? What is your suggestion, then? How would you have dealt with Russia? How would you have dealt with Russia differently? I love these guys, man. They're so awesome. They're like, mm, mm, the reason why Russia is invading Ukraine is because we didn't talk to the bad people uh, like they were bad people. We talked to them like they were good people. Or them taking pieces of territory in Georgia under Bush or under or, or Crimea under, under Obama. If we just ignore it hard enough, then, then maybe it sort of goes away. And now deterrence has failed. And it seems like the world order is radically reshifting. Like the United States, we seem to treat this as almost a natural disaster, like a thing happening far away. But in Europe, they're treating this as, a, as an epic shifting event. And they're talking about rearming. They're talking about forming new security alliances with Eastern European countries. Where do you think this ends up? I think this is actually turning out to be, I mean, obviously what's going on for the people of Ukraine is horrible right now. But I think in the long run, I think it's going to be a good thing because, first of all, Putin is being shown to be way less strong than we thought he was. Yeah, I mean, he's quite yeah. admiring. Yeah. Right. It, it was supposed to be a cakewalk. So was Iraq. You know, so surprised that he, he actually did it because it wasn't really necessary. I, I tried to explain one night on my show that I think a lot of this comes from he thinks he's the savior of the Russian people. I think when you get to that level where he's been in office, he's been in absolute power for 20 I love hearing stuff like this because... It's just cool to hear, like, what kind of new ways they're going to come up with. Like, they have to come up with, like, a reason. Everybody wants a reason for why things are happening. Okay? And it's, like, it's going to be it's gonna be fun. It's always going to be a good time. Like, especially if it goes beyond just, like, oh, he's just a bad guy. 20 years. Um, what is left? What, you know, what's in the soul of a man? He wants to be a hero. And he thinks this is the way to do it. I think people know this is history major stuff. Mm -hmm. Kiev, or Kiev, I guess mm -hmm. how we say it now, you know, is the ancestral home of Russia. It's the beginning of the Russian state from around the year 1000. I'm not saying that that gives them a right to take it. It is right. a completely different nation now. It, it changed. It's not even part of... Wait, so you think there wasn't a particular reason he was just bored? No, the particular reason is controlling the Ukrainian production of oil and gas uh, and also controlling Ukraine that is in its backyard uh, and, and ridding it of Western influence, as he has stated time and time again. That's what I think his, his uh, ultimate goal was. Um, numerous other reasons on top of that. Listen, listen. When Vladimir Putin says, like, Ukraine and Russia are one people, they're one people, they're one people... That's the that's the add additional justifications for people listening at home. There's always a Absolutely. a financial materialist component and a real reason as to why countries, governments, people behave the way that they do. And then they add ideological seasoning to their actions, whatever it takes to sell the the idea. Russia anymore, but that is and I think that's what is in his mind, is I'm going to reclaim this. Yes, it, the Russian state moved to Moscow, and, but it's almost similar to the way Kosovo. I mean, when Milosevic started the Balkan Wars, it was all about, it was, the year was 1989. It was the 600th anniversary. In, in that part of the world, that's like yesterday. You know, that's so foreign to the way Americans think. But it was 1389. There's this battle in Kosovo, which, again, not even part of Serbia anymore, but it was the ancestral home of Serbia, and we got to get it back. And it, this, I think, is what Putin wants. That is what he thinks in his mind. And what he's finding out is that not only are the Ukrainian people hate him for doing this, but the Russian people hate him for doing this. They're like, are you crazy? This is not the world we live in anymore. We're on TikTok now. We can see dogs getting shot and and families being torn apart and things blown up and we're, we're a modern Wait, what dogs getting shot that's what dude white liberal brain damage first thing that comes to mind is dogs being shot dude i love that sorry country are trying to be one look at what what are you doing so i think it's just going to turn out horribly for russia the question i was going to ask you is do you think it was the right thing to 
not only keep NATO going after the Soviet Union fell, but to encroach right up to Russia's borders. Because so, a lot of people don't, uh, and yes. I don't. Uh, I, I actually do think that, it, well, I, I think that, here's the thing, if you are going to make overtures to a nation that they should try to join NATO, and then not back it up, that's the worst thing you could do. So we took sort of the worst path with Ukraine. We were encouraging them, maybe you'll join NATO, maybe you won't. Hey, wait a minute, what the fuck? Is this a, is this a good take alert? What's happening? Join NATO, if you make an overture, maybe we'll consider it. And so that leaves them in an incredibly vulnerable wait a minute. spot because we're basically saying to them. But he's like, dude, you're a neocom, brother. There's no fucking shot. Unless maybe, I guess maybe he just feels like you can do that to smaller nations, but you can't do that to Russia. That you have to make overtures to us, and meanwhile, Russia is on your on your eastern border, and so Russia is looking at that, going, "No, we're not going to we're not going to do this at all." If we had wanted, if we if you're going to make a move, make it strong. In other words, but if you're going to have Ukraine join NATO, make Ukraine join NATO, and you make sure that they have the armaments necessary to defend themselves, and you have a mutual alliance pact. But if you're an independent armed nation, by the way, right now, if like to me, the 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 one long lasting ramification of this that's incredible. No, I, by the way, no, he he took the other side of that argument, where he said, you know. You should have made Ukraine join NATO immediately and arm them and that you should arm every other country as well and jo make them join NATO as well is what he's saying. Never mind. Incredibly dangerous. If you're a non-aligned nation right now, you're not, you don't have a mutual defense guarantee with either China or Russia or the United States. How fast are you looking for a nuclear weapon right now? I mean, you are looking like hell for a nuclear weapon. Fuck. Okay. I'm back in. I'm back in. He's right. He's right. And you should weapon yeah. right now because you don't want to be in a conventional war with a major power seems like ben shapiro has been watching the hasanabi broadcast that is literally just in the hasanabi doctrine he just repeated the hasanabi doctrine come on dude but that's, not, but that's not what i'm asking you i'm asking you 30 years ago yes 1991 mm -hmm. okay what should we have done then the soviet union fell nato was formed specifically to counter the soviet union and communism, which now was no more. Why keep that lions going? Why not? They're not having a bad conversation about this. This is like shocking, making me upset. God damn it, dude. What the fuck? Invite Russia at that moment. Boris Yeltsin took over, right? Invite them. You're one of us now, as opposed to keeping this organization going past the point where it had well that was the overtures were made they just said lol no obviously not the entire point of nato is the fuck russia pact <laughs> a reason to be going i mean the question is whether you really thought that russia was like. going to be and develop toward being a friendly nation to the west or not if you were if but you were that, a skeptical but that caused them not to be i mean it, i wonder if that's the case i mean jesus christ this is some bill maher like the people were brave for flying the planes type take right here well, we'll never know. But if they had disbanded NATO and said, "Look, we're all we're all capitalist countries now. You're not. We're not fighting communism anymore, and we're not fighting the Soviet Union because it doesn't exist. So we should stop having we, this organization which treats you like the enemy well, I, and bring you in." So I, I disagree to one extent, which is that you'll notice that there are a bunch of nations that that Putin has attempted to invade. Not one of them is a member of NATO. So I think Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia would all be Russia right now if if we'd gotten rid of NATO. I mean, Finland has been bordering Russia since 1949 as a member of NATO. All, all of these nations... Okay. Wait, as a member of NATO? Wait, what? Wait, he just making shit up. Like, he literally... Did he just realize that, like, Finland's existence kind of destroys what he meant with, like, Latvia and shit? So he had to just lie about it and be like, Finland's been there since... 1949 is a NATO member nation. That's just a lie. That's you just straight up made that up. It's 2022 and Finland is still not a part of NATO. And also Finland's existence as a neutral country up until this point kind of disproves Ben Shapiro's theory. Finland is not part of NATO, but he's right about the Baltic States. They'd 100% be part of Russia if they were not NATO right now. I mean, dude, I hate to admit this, but it's 100% yes, they would. They literally would. There would be some kind of fucking uh, uh, Russian pact or, or, or uh, ones that have existed that would absolutely uh, add uh, the Baltic states into it. Straight up. They would. 100%. But Georgia isn't? Yeah, because Georgia was invaded after George W. Bush said... What do you mean? After, the reason why Georgia is literally invaded is because 
George W. Bush said that Georgia and Ukraine should be invited into NATO. That's when Georgia got invaded by Vladimir Putin. Extent, which is that you'll notice that there are a bunch of nations that, that Putin has attempted to invade. Not one of them is a member of NATO. So I think Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia. So should NATO exist? I'm confused. No. I don't think NATO should exist. I think in the absence of NATO, I mean, this is like literally we're doing complete fucking revisionist history here. If NATO wasn't built, if the Marshall Plan was implemented exclusively, not for uh, uh, influential gain amongst Western uh, European states, but exclusively to rebuild Europe for no reason other than just rebuilding Europe. If the, the uh, USSR was allowed to continue its uh, dominance, if the USSR was allowed to uh, influence and offer material support to communist parties all around Europe, and NATO was not used as a counterbalance against that to quite literally do right-wing terror in many nations. And there was a collective security agreement that the USSR was also a part of. We would be living in a very different world. But again, we're not. We're not there. We're, we're not a part of that. We're not in that world. It's not a world in which we live in. The reason why NATO was built was for the express purpose of America utilizing European nations in a collective capacity against the USSR. They were terrified of communism winning. They, uh, they were terrified of socialist communists who won the fucking resistance war within Europe from gaining prominence. If there are three separate factions, when you have the fascists and you have the communists and you have the liberal capitalists, okay? The feckless liberal capitalists specifically led by the American feckless liberal capitalists, were able to utilize successfully in post-World War II the fascist militancy against the communists. Even though the communists themselves were actively a part of the resistance and were able to purge the fascist forces within Europe. This is what happened time and time again in every fucking European country. This was done also... With the, with the help of NATO. Kind of a commie take, to be honest. I mean, yeah, it is a commie take. What's the threat of NATO on Russia's borders now except to stop Russia's imperialist actions like what is going on right now? NATO is not a defensive pact. It has never been a defensive pact, and it still does not... It still does not exist as a defensive pact. NATO has been utilized in the past to engage in America's efforts to do imperialism it's basically yet another way for america's protection racket to continue and while it seems like they are a justifiable force here helping the ukrainians rid themselves of russian sovereignty historically speaking they have never been uh defensive unless you think kyle rittenhouse was a uh, engaging in defensive maneuvers estonia would all be russia right now if if we'd gotten rid of nato I mean, Finland has been bordering Russia since 1949 as a member of NATO. Wrong. All, all of these nations joined NATO in the 90s. Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, I think they all joined either 99 or... Historically, blah, blah, we're talking about what's happening now. If you don't understand the inception of certain uh, countries, you will never understand why other countries that they are literally diametrically opposed to or created, the pact that was created uh, to fight against said country you're just always going to just relegate back to good versus evil this is a good for the good forces are fighting against the evil forces of course you can't ignore history when talking about these sorts of things 2004 yeah. and the and that was in direct opposition to at that point putin right you're talking late 90s early and please don't talk about eastern europe you literally don't have no clue what you are talking about thank you Power. bro eastern europe let me just explain something to you okay but one day you might recognize that western europe does not give a shit about you okay i hope this day never comes so just remember that a lot of you dumb motherfuckers sit in the chat in like estonia latvia okay and you're like stay out of eastern european people's business okay listen motherfucker you're just con you're just territory to be conquered okay Either it's going to happen by Western forces or Russia. Shut the fuck up. Acting like you have any sort of sovereignty in this matter. Jesus Christ, dude. And I say this as a Turkish person who was a dog to the American NATO war machine. Stay out of Eastern European people's business. Like, shut up. Shut up. You're not a country, okay? You're literally a vassal state. So fucking annoying.
1999. So I think the sort of optimistic vision, which is that if we had made more nice overtures to Boris Yeltsin, Yeltsin was a plutocrat and he was an incompetent plutocrat at that. And then he was replaced by a much more competent plutocrat and a dictatorial plutocrat who, was, who had territorial ambition. And so I tend to be much more you know, hawkish in terms of not trusting other nations to spin on a dime and suddenly become our friends. And, and so the well, idea that- with Japan. Funny to say that when you come from Turkey too. I mean, I admit, at least I admit it, at least I admit my country's position, the country I came from, but Eastern Europeans think like, oh, we're a part of, uh, we're part of NATO now. It's different. It's like, no, it's not different, dude. You are literally, it's not different. I promise you. Okay. I hope that that day never comes. So I'm saying stuff like that is how you get Eastern Europeans to come after you, unfortunately. Okay. I mean, yeah, I know. Damn right. Roast that guy for advocating for his country's own best interests. Brother, your country's own best interest is insignificant in this conversation if we're talking about Russia versus Western powers, okay? That's my point. Like, people act like there's a, some kind of sovereignty for smaller nations, okay? There, there is no sovereignty for your, your, your nation or your personal interests. You understand that, right? You can, it, it can make you feel bad when I say it, but it's just the unfortunate reality. You saying that from the American comfort home is funny, too. Dude, I think I, I literally am saying that because I'm in the fucking imperial core. If there was any sort of sovereignty or sanctity or security consideration for Ukraine, then there would be a no-fly zone implemented over Ukraine. There would be a fucking nuclear holocaust right now, potentially. But there isn't one. Do we see anything but just javelin missiles being shipped in? Do you see a single American boot inside of Ukrainian borders? Do you, that's what the Ukrainians want. Ukrainians are living through World War III right now. And a lot of you living in eastern europe also recognize that and that's a that's a real fucking fear that you have deep down inside that like this nato pact might not hold we're seeing what's happening to fucking we're seeing what's happening to ukraine what if russia came after us the only reason why they would ever defend you okay is because you've already signed a pact and because that would dictate that they absolutely personally have to defend every ounce uh, every inch of nato territory to reassert their dominance as a global superpower okay ukraine wants to be in nato are they ever going to be in nato no and i know for a fucking fact that all you baltic motherfuckers in the chat right now are legitimately terrified for understandable reasons what if nato doesn't defend us either But don't fucking, like, don't sit here and act like these guys give a fuck about your sovereignty, man. Because they don't. The only reason why NATO would ever defend, like, any Baltic country is so that they can reassert their dominance. The moment that they feel like they can give an ounce of NATO territory back and Russia, if Russia recognizes that and pounces on that weakness... You know, it's over. You think they're going to go to nuclear war over fucking Latvia dude? Latvia, dude? No. If they ever would defend a NATO country, it would be defended exclusively so they can reinforce their, their uh, global power. Three days after Lithuanian Independence Day? I'm sorry. But they know it too. It's so crazy. The reason why, understandably, so many people... The reason why, understandably, so many people in Eastern Europe are terrified of this is because they also have that deep suspicion that maybe there are a two-tier protection for NATO. Different kinds of uh, countries that maybe get different kinds of protection and coverage from NATO that maybe they would not be afforded. That's why they get so fucking heated when you're like, dude, you have no sovereignty. You have no play in this conversation. Your sovereignty only extends as far beyond as like your national leadership is interested in getting guns from America. The moment... Like, if you think, now this obviously would never happen, but if you think, like, tomorrow, uh, the Lithuanian people decided, like, oh, we're fucking, we're, we want complete sovereignty. We don't want to be part of NATO. We want to neutralize with Russia. You think NATO would allow that to happen? I fucking doubt it. Or even if they were like, okay, you're no longer a part of Russia. I mean, uh, you're no longer a part of NATO. You're now a part of fucking Russia. They would literally do everything in their power to fucking reduce you to rubble. <laughs> Someone said, NATO doesn't even defend Greece from Turkey, who are both its members. I mean, again... Don't compare NATO. Don't compare. Don't look at what Turkey does in NATO. Turkey is fucking insane. Okay. 
Turkey is in a league of its own. I'm not saying that as a Turkish person. Turkey is also actively in conflict with France uh, during doing a, pro a proxy war in Libya currently, and also uh, in Greece uh, as well. So uh, Turkey is is in a unique predicament always. So stop mentioning Turkey. You will only be further confused if you bring up Turkey. Japan and Germany, didn't it? Well, no, we, we fully occupied Japan and Germany after nuking Japan twice. Hi, Hasanabi. I've been in a coma since the year 2000. Did the newly elected president of Russia, Vladimir Putin, get accepted in his request to join the military alliance of NATO? <laughs> Good one. And after firebombing the living hell out of Germany. So we didn't actually do any of that to, to Russia. Well, but right. we welcomed Japan and Germany. Wait. Dude, Bill Maher is spitting right now, by the way. Bill Maher, is Bill Maher like fucking... And, and, and so the well, idea... Well, Japan and Germany, didn't it? Well, no, we, we fully... Wait. He was an incompetent plutocrat at that. And then he was replaced by a much more competent plutocrat and a dictatorial plutocrat who, was, who had territorial ambition. And so I tend to be much more, you know, hawkish in terms of not trusting other nations to spin on a dime and suddenly become our friends. And, and so the well, idea it that... it with Japan and Germany, didn't it? Well, no, we, we fully occupied Japan and Germany after nuking Japan twice and after firebombing the living hell out of Germany. So we didn't actually do any of that to, to Russia. Well, but right. we welcomed Japan and Germany. They're right. Liberals would literally not even admit that in some ways. Liberals have a more a, a closer position to Bill Maher here than Ben. Ben's right. We did. We fucking destroyed Germany and we destroyed Japan and then we have active military bases in both countries in perpetuity. Germany. We occupied I, them and deposed, forcibly deposed well, their emperor. Of course, right after the war, we had to. I mean, oh, no, we were, still have troops were, there right now. I mean... <laughs> yeah, he's... This is right. This is true. He is correct about this. Because and we have troops they in want Okinawa. them there. Yes, but for decades... They want them there. Uh, and they're on our side. They're not... Okay, here's the thing. First of all, Okinawa literally couldn't be further than the truth. I can't speak for Ramstein. I can't speak for Germany. But... Pretty sure Japan does not want American troops in Okinawa, okay? The main reason why our allegiances continued with Japan and Germany, though, is a material one. It's not because of some fucking ideolo uh, idealistic, like, spiritual notion. The real reason why Japan... Yeah, no, they the, the Japanese actually despise the, the military base, I'm pretty sure. Uh, like, they literally are, are terrible. Anyway, so part of it is because, one... A lot of money was given to these countries after we fucking reduced them to rubble. And two, it's just, it's, they're in a trade partnership now. Like, it's good business. That's the real reason. Trade is the real reason why these countries can work alongside one another. And not necessarily because they are ideologically libtards now or some shit. Occupying them. They're not treating Germ Germany and Japan as an enemy. They're, we treat them as an ally. What I'm saying is we forcibly turn them into an ally. I mean, we literally had American troops. We still have American bases in Germany. We have no American bases in Russia. Meaning the the idea that we were going to take a, an, a bases. I love that. I love Ben Shapiro's idea. Is like might is right politics, but like when someone else does it, he's like, no, it's unacceptable. I mean, dude, the way Ben's talking about the way Ben's talking about like Germany and Japan, like industrial powerhouses. Like Russia can't even talk about like the Baltics that way. Okay. But, but when you are living in the imperial core, this is what you can say and get away with and totally be justified in saying. And people will literally turn around and be like, you're so right, dude. You are so right, King. Is in Germany to fight Russia, to right. fight the Soviet Union, which doesn't exist anymore. Yes, but in the aftermath of that, we fully toppled the regime. And then we proceeded to occupy and help reconstitute well, we, the government in that we regime. We had to occupy them right after the war. I'm not making the argument against occupation in Germany or Japan. Okay, the point I'm making we is we occupied them until they were able to stand on their own feet, and then we left. The bases no, we there were for them because they. No, were, we didn't. We did not. Uh, no. For our allies now. Well, I mean, I mean we, we, we we needed to keep the bases there also in order to encourage Japan, for example, not to go after nuclear weapons. The idea is we'll defend you so you don't have to defend yourself. We don't want you rearming militarily. Right? We built an entire European Union and, and EC. Yes. We also made... Ben, ben on foreign policy is pretty funny because he sometimes will have the premise uh, premises correct, but then there's a secret premise that always is working behind the scenes that allows them to get to the exact opposite opinion that normally a human being with, like, a working, uh, uh, you know... Uh, working part of their brain that allows them to feel empathetic thoughts would arrive at. And that part, of course, is the, the racism puzzle piece or the American exceptionalism puzzle piece that literally just always, he's just like, 
We had to occupy them. And then we stopped, uh, you know, and then we, we did trade relationships. And, and the real reason why, you know, we can't ever uh, have an alliance with Russia in a similar capacity is because uh, we don't have a military base in Russia. That's not the only way that you can fucking do allegiances. Like, you don't have to straight up have a military base in these countries to be able to work with them. In order to keep Germany down, right? That also was... made the emperor go on the radio and admit he wasn't a god. Right. So, I mean, th th so there, there's... Try to make that speak. Th there's, a, there's a really good book by a, a woman um, <laughs> whose name escapes me right now. It's called Secondhand Time, won the Nobel Prize uh, a few years back. And it was, it was an oral history of Russians talking about the Soviet Union post-Russia. So it's just her interviewing a bunch of people who are standing around in 2000 talking about what the Soviet Union was like. And there's one particular interview that's really striking where the, she's talking to an old Soviet who had been imprisoned, tortured in Lubyanka by the KGB, uh, who'd had friends and family members shot by the, by the KGB, and ended up, or the GRB at the time, and ended up, uh, GRU at the time, and ended up in World War II seeing a person who'd tortured him. And the person looked at him and said, we're both Russian. And he says now, he says, I don't understand the world I'm living in. My kids want Levi's and they want radios. Why can't we have that Russian greatness back? And the, 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 the th I think the big, biggest mistake the West makes generally, and this is true with Russia today, it's true with China as well, is that we tend to think that everybody wants the same things that we want. They want material well-being. They want longer lives. They want their kids to go to good schools. Wait, what does China and Russians want? <clears throat> it's not that. On a fundamental level, unfortunately, I think that that's not always true. I think that... What? Bro, what is he saying right now? That there are a lot of people who want, George Orwell wrote this about Hitler in 1940. He said, you know, one of the reasons Hitler is successful is because what Hitler re realizes is something that we in the West don't, which is we say we want a washing machine and we want, and we want a nice radio. What Hitler understands is sometimes people want blood, struggle, toil, and tears. Yeah. And, and if they don't want that, then they, they, it takes them a while to realize that the cost of that is too high. And maybe that's what we're seeing right now in, in Ukraine, we can hope, is that the Russian people are, are beginning to realize the Russian people, by the way, five years ago were polled about Stalin and 70% of whom said, good guy. That maybe they're starting to realize. What? Dude, he went to like 11 different places with this. I don't even know where to begin. Okay. Just unhinged ramblings. Is he trying to say that people in Russia and China don't actually want comfort, safety, and security? Does he not realize that a world that is dominated by America what people want and what their and how their states operate at the behest of those desires if those desires are in line with what the state is doing let's say is the death and destruction of the United States of America i just want to point that out like like wanting to at the very least end america's dominance and and saying they want safety and security is not it's not in contention with one another, okay? That's like, that is actually, as a matter of fact, totally in line with those wishes. I'm straight, just not always. Thank you for the 50, get the subs. I just want to point that out really quickly, okay? I want people to understand. If, like, the Chinese people's interest is about, like, safety, security, or if the Russian people's interest is safety, security... Uh, and, and, you know, comfort. And then their state is like, we are going to try to strike a blow at the heart of American dominance globally. Then that is in line with their interests of safety and security. I think that's what people don't understand. It's very difficult to comprehend that from the American point of view, because your state's always, your state never has to fear. Like, realistically speaking, you never fear a much larger superpower uh, uh, destroying you. So you can't comprehend that. So uh, what do you do for work? And, oh, yeah, he's right about the part where many Russians wanted back the old USSR, but it's because many became jobless and had a better life, safer and more, safer and more secure under the old Russian communist regime. Yes, I, I understand that. But that's because, you know... The, the current oligarchs fucking destroyed and, and plundered and robbed. Uh, robbed uh, the, the, the Russian coffers.
cost the poll to this. he took. Uh, there have been multiple polls that, that show that, that Stalin is is still held in fairly high esteem by a significant percentage of the population. Oh, uh, Stalin. I thought you meant Putin. No, not Sorry. Putin. Stalin. Yeah. And and so the, yes, they, well, because strong man is built into the Russian culture. And I also would say this about the Russian people. Wait, Americans are afraid of being invaded all the time. Hollywood built an entire industry in our, um, around Americans being afraid of everything. Yeah, but it's not a realistic fear. Like, if you think as an American, you have a, a, a fear of your safety and security, you've never, I mean, I know you're not American, you're Australian, but, uh, Korean, but Americans don't have a, a fear, a legitimate fear of their safety and security in a way that even like a regional territorial power like uh, a Turkish person could uh, have fear of. Okay? Like, it's so much. Dude, your mate has a nice beard. <laughs> My mate also builds spaceships um, in his off time when he's not being my mate. Uh, Americans are so devoid of, like, legitimate fear of a larger superpower dominating it that we create our own boogeymen to be afraid of. Like, we consider people coming across the board to find a better future for themselves to be an invasion. Like, that is literally the height of luxury, dog. In comparison to the, you know, people in the Baltics that I was shitting on earlier. Like, those people, they have some legitimate fears. Being dominated is, is in their uh, shared history. Part of the reason why people lost their fucking minds after 9-11 was because for the first time in a very long time and for the first time in American history, a foreign nation or foreign adversary or a foreign power was able to strike a civilian target. If you've lived anywhere else, you've seen civilian strikes, you know, happen regularly. Even in Europe, that's happened regularly. You know who has done that, by the way? I don't know. A four-letter treaty organization, whatever you want to call it, um, had some some to do with some civilian strikes happening. But, you know, Americans will just not ever feel that. You can't have communism for as long as they had it. And it's a little like being from a broken home and then being abused as a child. Communism was so evil. I mean, what it did to the psyche, the cynicism that it incurred in people, that you're not going to get over that in just a generation. I think it's a very cynical country, a very cynical mentality there. And, I, you know, when I hear people nowadays fact-free talking about how, you know, a lot of, uh, like, you know, if you look at Gen Z, it's like a lot of them think, oh, maybe communism, be good to give that another try. You know, they just, they just don't understand. They, because they have this idea in their head that if, if something happened before they were alive, what does it matter? It didn't really happen. It's like, but stuff did happen. <laughs> stuff did happen. I know you weren't around for it, but. Yeah, a lot of stuff happened, you know. We did a lot of stuff on the capitalist side. It really did. And other people noticed it. And we learned that lesson. You know, communism doesn't work. I'm and straight, it makes just not always thinking for the thing of the subs. They had about we pretend to work and they pretend to pay us. That was the system. I mean, that's, that's not going to go away overnight. You know what's not going away overnight? Fucking Red Scare propaganda in the mind of a boomer that is brain rotten like fucking Bill Maher. I see a lot of Gen Zers saying we should try fascism again. That too. That's real. That there is a there is a real interest in in Gen Z for that too. All of this comes from the the anger and and lack of security and volatility that younger generations feel under the crushing oppression of capitalism. The system of liberal capitalism is falling apart 
faster than it can pick itself up by way of the welfare state. Okay. There are a couple different reasons for why it's happening. Part of it is because, you know, eventually you're going to run out of territory that you can conquer. And eventually you're going to have to forcibly keep countries oppressed, which we are doing already, but do it in, in more obvious ways. And that is creating instability. Why the fuck would Zoomers feel protected and like capitalism? When they live in a post-2008 world where they've seen the economy collapse, when they've seen their material realities get worse and worse overall, especially even in the imperial core, uh, as in living in the United States of America, why would they? Why would they think that this system is good? It's completely understandable. It's, it's the most human thing to look at what's going on now and be like, yeah, this system needs to change, right? Like, there has to be a better way. This is not working.